Welcome everyone. We'll get started in a few moments, but I'd like to wait for more of our expected participants to flow onto the platform. While we wait, on screen is the ARIS content disclaimer. ARIS webinars, content and media are created and published online for informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. For a full copy of the disclaimer, disclaimer please visit our website. Also, the webinar will be recorded and available on the website in the next few days. And while we continue to wait for attendees to join the platform, I'd like to mention that ARIS is partnering with Climate Check to offer climate risk assessment reports for properties in Canada as of tomorrow. Information about this can be retrieved at arisinfo.com slash CA. By the way of housekeeping today, I'll mention that there will be a time dedicated for Q&A with the panelists after the formal discussion. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A section of the platform. We prefer that you please place them in the Q&A section rather than in the chat session as we may not see them there. Okay, we'll get started. I'm Jeff Derner, ARIS's Senior Vice President of Sales for North America, and we are pleased to host today's session, Integrating Climate Risk Assessment with Environmental Due Diligence in Canada. Climate risk considerations are front and center in commercial real estate transactions. Property owners, environmental professionals, Developers, lenders, and investors must increasingly evaluate and disclose physical climate risks for individual properties in more extensive portfolios. They also must align these assessments with existing due, due diligence processes. Critical to this evaluation is reliable climate data, especially data that focuses on physical climate risks such as heat, fire, precipitation, flood, and drought. Today's discussion will focus on physical climate risk and data, the current regulatory landscape and the factors driving increased attention to climate risk assessments, data outputs hazards included in the climate risk evaluation, and the typical scope of work for climate risk due diligence and existing portfolio analysis. The users of physical climate risk data, how they use it, and how environmental professionals can assist in the assessment process. We are very pleased to welcome two guests, Cal Inman, founder of CEO, founder and CEO of Climate Check, a climate risk data company. Cal is also a Bay Area commercial real estate developer and lecturer at UC Berkeley. And Joelle Dubrow, senior environmental planner with SLR Consulting Canada, a consulting firm focused on environmental and advisory solutions to achieve sustainability goals. Joelle has a strong focus on technical environmental management and climate risk resilience including impact assessment programs, risk assessments, permitting, sustainable practices, and regulatory compliance reviews. To start us off, I'll turn it over to you, Cal. I think you're on mute, Cal. There we go. Getting started. Thanks for having me today, Jeff. Um, Pleasure. We. Uh, we started Climate Check about four years ago, uh, partnered with ARIS uh, about a year and a half ago. And since then, we've been working on this uh, Canadian data set. Uh, and so we're excited to roll it out, uh, excited to answer questions and uh, see if we can help folks out here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and click through these slides. Uh, uh, yeah, a bit about me, my background's commercial real estate. So our company really lives at the intersection of commercial real estate, the built environment and um, and this climate risk world. So our company is me, commercial real estate side, and a bunch of climatologists, atmospheric scientists, um, data scientists. And our goal is really to pull in all the best climate data in a reliable way and have it searchable on an individual property level. So you can get insights around climate risk. So what I wanna talk about briefly is what is the data? What is climate risk? Who's using it? Um, why they're using it and how they're using it. So I'll take you through uh, a brief example of a property in Canada. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, open it up. And then Joel's got some great uh, context as well for how consultants, due diligence consultants are actually using this information. At the highest level, climate risk data uh, it, it helps us understand these natural hazards associated with climate change. So we look at the risk profile today and then into the future through 2060. We look at this data in five-year increments 
and the hazards we cover are kind of broken up into two broad categories. One are chronic risks, kind of ongoing risks that affect quality of life and operational things like utilities, expenses, things like that. So those include precipitation, uh, drought or water scarcity, ex and extreme heat. Um, and then the second category uh, are, are more acute hazards. They're things that happen with lower frequency, uh, but high intensity that cause loss, insurable loss. So in that, in that category, put wildfire, high winds, flooding, and flooding is one of the more complex ones. So I'm gonna break out flooding for you, just to give you an example, of one of the hazards that we cover in the data sets we cover. Um, there's many types of flooding, uh, from coastal flooding, from sea level rise, to inland flooding. And for inland flooding, that can include surface flooding or pluvial flooding, uh, where there's heavy rainfall events and water accumulates, uh, or riverine flooding uh, or fluvial flooding. Um, and so we bring in all of these data sets into one place. So when you search a parcel, you get all of the information. Uh, to give you an example of where the data comes from and what it is, we take for fluvial flooding, surface flooding, for instance, we take future rainfall events and then pour it over the entire topography of Canada on elevation maps, taking into account soil porosity and see where the water pools. And then we can get depth information of these floods uh, and the probability of these floods happening in the future. Uh, so the image to the right you see here is uh, surface flooding in Montreal along an expressway. And we go through a series of validations for all of our data sets. Uh, so for this one, we matched it up against, uh, I think it was a flood in 1987 along this expressway here on the upper right hand side of the image. Uh, but this gives some kind of context about what the flood data looks like. Uh, the deeper color blues represent more depth. Uh, and again, like all our hazards, we're looking at risk today and then risk in the future based on these projected climate models um, 30 years out. Uh, with all of our data, we provide a one through 100 rating that represents risk, a relative risk to that individual property. Um, and alongside that, we provide key metrics. Uh, so for flood, it's obvious kind of probability of a flood and depth of a flood. So what's the frequency or probability of an event happening? And then what's the intensity? And so for flood, intensity is depth of a flood. Uh, I will note and won't go too deeply into it, but we do include multiple emission scenarios uh, for scenario modeling for uh, these climate risk uh, outputs. Uh, which is important for reporting and also giving kind of a range of uncertainty into the future. Um, and happy to get into more detail there uh, if there's any questions in the Q&A around that. Uh, so we have all of this data across the entire country. Which, by the way, it's a huge country uh, as far as land mass. Uh, and then we take, we want to understand how one individual asset, we start with the individual asset level, is affected by each of these hazards. So we'll either do a radius search or a polygon search and understand what hazards live within that area and then what risk is, uh, is, is in there. And so this is kind of our process of querying the data, but what's the output? Uh, what, what is the work product? Um, and this might be a little hard to see, so you might have to zoom in a little bit, but it's a 30-page deep dive report that takes all of that data and lays it out, one, graphically, uh, uh, over time in graphs and his, histograms, uh, but also uh, mapping it so we can understand kind of the, the local context around the property. Uh, we start with the first page of the report here. Uh, this is in Ikea in Nova Scotia. Um, and we rank each of the hazards from highest risk to lowest risk. So this property has the highest precipitation risk, some flooding risk, uh, significant heat risk, drought and no fire risk. And then the report is then organized uh, by each of these hazards. So I just pulled out a few pages just to give you all an example of, um, of what, the, what the output is. Uh, the second page, this shows the radius search, make sure we're looking at the right property uh, and kind of gives us an idea of where the improvements are upon that land. And then this is an excerpt from the flood pa page. So we have uh, pluvial flood risk on this property. Um, and you can kind of see where it's happening. It's kind of the back parking lot area against the building. So 
We're going to get into uh, a little later into the talk about what we do with this information and how we can take this risk information and communicate building vulnerability and then solutions. How can we adapt to these problems? But we start with the flood, uh, identifying some flood risk on this property. Um, and then another example, extreme heat. Um, just as a note in Canada, doing much better in climate change in general. It's a good news in the United States. The more north you go, uh, things seem to be getting a little uh, better. But we, we uh, for extreme heat, we'll match your individual property. And we measure extreme heat by counting the number of hot days in your location. So we look at the historical number of hot days in a specific location and then quantify what is a hot day in that location. And then we project out in the future what's frequency of those hot days are we going to have? And that's what this graph represents. Again, in both emission scenarios, what is a hot day? Um, and then on the next page here, we always do some benchmarking. So we show a baseline of uh, how does your property compare to the rest of the province or territory? And so this is a, some popular population weighted averages to kind of give you a comparison. Again, heat risk is a pretty coarse risk, so you don't see a lot of variance uh, in certain regions. This is an example of a US customer we have. Uh, it's a, a product we also have available in Canada, uh, but I think is pretty illustrative how folks roll up all these individual assets and look at a larger portfolio of assets. So um, this is 3,000 properties of collateral that a lender has. Um, and we break it out geographically and in this histogram on the left. So you can kind of see the distribution of extreme flood risk here on the left. And then we're, how's that distributed geographically on the right? So the flood risk is pretty much across the entire country, but they have 17% of the property in extreme flood risk area. And how that's used uh, from a portfolio screening level is really understanding where, where are those outlier risks and then dive deeper onto those individual reports. So these are some examples about of how the data is used. Um, so I think briefly, I'd like to discuss who's using climate data, who are our customers, and why are they using it? Um, I'd say about three years ago, we saw a big uptick within commercial real estate investors. And I think the driver there was ESG reporting. Their limited partners, their investors uh, wanted some type of ESG reporting. We're seeing this more and more often now because any investor that comes from Europe is going to require um, ESG reporting, specifically climate risk reporting. Um, and then as the industry's progressed, all of the big companies started doing it. We're, it's now becoming best practices amongst those that aren't required to do this type of reporting. Uh, and they'll look at it in two ways, really asset level due diligence when they're looking at a new asset or when a lender is originating a loan and then existing portfolio analysis. Um, and since then, there's been two big regulatory drivers, one in the US and one in Canada, it's pushing a lot of folks to kind of take a look at this. Probably a lot of your clients are looking at this in some way. Uh, which are is the SEC in the US and B15 in Canada. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically what these, uh, these federal level regulations are saying is that climate risk, risk to climate change is a material disclosure uh, for financial institutions and large companies. Um, and, uh, and that makes folks look at it because they need to look at it, understand it and disclose it. Um, and then how is all this data and reports and portfolio analysis work. We're really the beginning of this journey. And it's a, a, important to understand that the due diligence consultants are an important part of this. So we present no different than at ESA, um, the fundamental data and the risk information around a property. That will never replace the human element, the consultant. Um, and so step one here is, climate hazard screening. That's what that report does. We screen a property for the different hazards and try to understand and identify which hazards are there. The next step uh, performed by uh, due diligence consultants is a vulnerability assessment. So going back to that IKEA example, okay, we have flood on the property. Is this on a parking lot? Is this a, uh, affecting a building? Is there a subterranean structure uh, that's gonna flood? Are there generators in there? 
what is the vulnerability of the building and the property? Um, and then the next step, the third step is, what are the resiliency measures we can take? How can we adapt this property um, and protect it and mitigate these risks? So I think that's a, a, a really high level of what the data is, who's using it. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'll pass it off to Joelle, who will give us some context about some of the work she's done in the space. Awesome. Thanks, Cal. I'm just going to take over sharing screen here. Give me a moment. All right. I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to start by using slightly different language than Cal. We had this conversation yesterday and that when he's talking climate risk, he's talking risk to the, the property. He's looking at the exposure and the likelihood of an event at the property itself. Um, Cal also talks about property. He talks about assets. Um, my preferred language is element. Uh, so when we, we speak to elements, we're not just talking to the property. We're not just talking to the asset. We could be looking at subcomponents of that asset. It might be the roof. It might be the drainage. It might be the walls, or it could be the people. It could be the um, natural environment on that property, whether you have a lot of trees, a few trees, um, grasses, whether whether it's paved, et cetera. So um, when we look at exposure of a property, we wanna be considering all of these different elements of the property itself. Uh, Cal's climate check report also looks at the likelihood of an event happening. So he's looking at the climate hazard and the likelihood of it occurring under existing conditions, as well as how that likelihood is changing over time. And that's really important um, for, for climate risk uh, so that you can understand how your risk por profile is changing over time. What you might not consider to be a significant risk now may be a significant risk 30 years from now. And so understanding how your risk profile is changing will allow you to take adaptive and resilient measures now um, through your asset management programs or um, what, whatever it is you use to manage your property uh, to build resilience over time. Uh, another important factor in understanding risk, uh, Cal referred to vulnerability, I'm referring to it as consequence, same, same meaning, different language. Uh, so when we're looking at consequence, we want to consider um, different factors. And th the factors that you're considering will really depend on who is doing your climate risk assessment. Uh, factors could be financial. They could be uh, the, the built environment, they could be people um, the con and the consequences on those. And then you wanna consider what, what are your definitions of that consequence or your thresholds for those consequences? What do you consider to be a low consequence on that specific element? Um, you know, is it three extreme heat days you, you consider to be a moderate consequence and four bumps you up to a high consequence. It really depends on what factors you're looking at. Um, and then you're also going to be looking at the sensitivity and the adaptive capacity of the element being considered. So using Cal's IKEA uh, example, we can, we can loop back and, you know, IKEA might be relatively... Um, resilient to high risk or high, high uh, temperature extreme heat type of events. Uh, they might just say, yeah, you know what, we'll just blast the AC and that's totally fine. We can adapt. Um, we'll, we'll account for it in our uh, financials moving forward. But if in, instead on that property, you had an aging uh, multi-residential unit with a high population of vulnerable people living in that unit, um, it, it would be a lot more sensitive. Your consequence to those extreme heat events would be significantly higher um, when you were looking at the impacts on people. So when we're th thinking of climate change risk, we have to consider all of these different factors and the reports like the climate check reports help us understand the exposure and the likelihood, but then the environmental professionals uh, can come in and facilitate these discussions surrounding consequence. And the other thing with consequence is we don't want to be just looking at 
the property itself. We need to be considering the surrounding environment. So yes, IKEA might uh, have a high risk of extreme precipitation, but what's the property next door? Does it have an unstable slope? Would that slope be at risk of failure in an extreme precipitation event? So it, as environmental professionals, we're trained to have this holistic view um, to kind of help us understand not just um, the rabbit hole. Some disciplines can go really far down a rabbit hole and focus on one specific uh, thing, whereas environmental professionals were trained to look a little more broadly. And finally, when, when we talk about risk, it's important to understand that risk is subjective. So what one property owner, business, or individual individual might consider a high or extreme risk um, related to financials, for example, um, you know, a, another another owner might consider that to be low risk because they have the the portfolio or the the financial stability to absorb that risk. So the current state of practice in Canada, um, it's evolving and it's evolving quickly. Uh, I would never uh, call myself a climate change risk expert because the, the environment is changing so rapidly. So uh, yes, I'm experienced, but other people may have very different experiences because um, the, the space is evolving so quickly. So from my personal experience, I have seen a, a big focus on asset management. Um, different government organizations or larger organizations looking to understand um, specific assets or portfolio of a assets uh, so that they can incorporate resilience strategies and adaptive, uh, adaptive strategies into their asset management planning. So um, if, if one large commercial property is at risk of flooding, for example, they may choose to start to implement some strategies now or as part of their asset management program um, and, and those life cycle of those different elements um, to incorporate resilience. Uh, the, the other space where we have seen um, some climate change risk considerations is with the National Building Code of Canada. They have some climate factors. Table C2 has climate change factors um, to incorporate a change in climate into uh, vertical infrastructure design. And then we also see the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code that has uh, some specific standards as well. Within the planning environment, um, we're seeing that uh, environmental assessment processes are starting to require consideration of climate change. They look at the effects of the project on climate change, so your greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the effects of the environment on the project, and that would include climate related risks. Uh, we've also seen quite a bit of municipal climate action planning, so com community-based and social-based planning. Uh, there are quite a few funding programs out there to support that pl those planning exercises. Uh, so that is primarily where I have seen um, climate change risk um, in Canada. And then we're going to get into some regulatory drivers. As I mentioned, uh, the climate change space is changing quickly in Canada, and a big part of that is these regulatory drivers. So we have the environmental assessment processes with their different um, requirements to consider climate change. As I just mentioned, uh, municipalities are um, in incorporating climate action planning, not just at the community level, but they're also starting to look at it when considering development applications, and that can influence uh, zoning decisions. Um, flood risk data in Canada is also uh, evolving. So while municipalities may have previously con considered flood zones for a 100-year flood, they're now, you know, maybe updating their that to a 200-year flood limit for uh, their, their different zoning um, policies. Uh, there's various funding programs that either fund uh, fund climate resilience projects specifically or for example, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. And then there's also fu funding programs that have climate risk assessment as a condition of receiving funding. So uh, Infrastructure Canada has their Climate Lens program, for example. 
Uh, the private sector businesses are also starting to examine physical and transitional risks. That's through TCFD reporting, as Cal mentioned. So I think Canada is uh, taking leaps and bounds in that space and maybe catching up to the US uh, quickly. And then there's also Canada's draft guideline B15 that just came out in March. And that sets out the uh, Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions expectations uh, related to the management of climate related risks by federally regulated financial institutions. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I'll pass it back to you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, really uh, insightful. Th thanks to both of you. Um, I, you know, a few questions listening to you both present. I mean, Cal, if you can, can you tell us exactly how the climate check products being used currently, like or for real life example of someone, you know, needing or asking for your product, your type of data? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty broad spectrum of users, but a, a kind of typical use case would be a real estate investor. Um, and they'll do really uh, two things with the data pretty consistently. One, they'll give us a list of all of their existing um, assets, what properties they own, and take them through and screen them. Uh, and this is a data product where they can sort and understand where are the high risk properties, um, where's our exposure, and where should we start our strategies around building adaptation around the entire portfolio. It doesn't necessarily mean disposition of properties, but really about how can we help protect these assets. And then on an ongoing acquisitions level, it's really a transactional uh, thing. They'll look at, pull a report, uh, and then many times they'll look at that uh, information and say, hey, we need some help kind of interpreting, understanding what the vulnerability or the consequences are to this property uh, specifically. What is the risk to the building? Uh, and then that's usually paired with uh, due diligence consultant, environmental consultants typically are building kind of books of business around this and teams to help folks understand that. So this work really goes alongside a phase one or ESA uh, or a property condition assessment, just all of the typical due diligence. So we're seeing that like within acquisition departments or origination within lenders, where they're adding it to their list of things that they're looking at uh, when they're doing a new transaction. And then kind of the last thing is once folks are doing this process for a while, they start taking kind of more broad data, aggregated data and help inform their investment thesis. And that's kind of more data and analytics use of, of the product. Uh, where should we go? Where should we target? And let's make it part of our, our bigger thesis about what, 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 how we're thinking about um, our fund, our company, whatever it is. Um, so those are kind of three ways that uh, folks are using it uh, day to day. Very helpful. And, and Joel, I mean, being in this line of work for as long as you have and working on all these projects, um, when you look at kind of the, the data set that Cal and Climate Check have been able to build, how, you know, three months ago or yesterday, how would you how would you get that data? Um, what, what, would the, what was that process like? It, it was labor intensive, Jeff. <laughs> um, uh, the, it, it depends on the consultancy that you that you work with. Some consultancies have uh, their own climate modelers, their own climate analysts, and they can pull all of that data using the different models and ensembles and everything that Cal's team has done. And there's also a lot of um, free, publicly available data put online by Environment Canada. Um, but it is labor intensive to go through and pick the, you know, the most relevant climate hazards and look at all of the different time periods and your different emission scenarios. And uh, then, you know, pulling the data itself and looking at how the likelihoods are changing. Uh, so, so it's really nice to see that someone has come out <laughs> with a kind of a one click solution for for that climate data. Great. And, and just to kind of take that thought a step further, you know, you, you explained how you aggregate the data or do. Um, hopefully you won't have to work that hard in the future. But the, the typical scope of work that, that you receive that you perform for your client, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what's your kind of run of the mill scope of services or when you tackle a project like this, what do you do? Yeah. So um my experience is mostly on um, built infrastructure, so not just looking at a property, but from the from the asset management perspective, um, the clients that we've worked with, we have built a climate uh, profile 
for that specific site. Um, and we also look at the, the planning regulations. We look at, you know, the broader um, environmental context. So what's happening upstream and downstream from that specific asset. Uh, we also were bringing in um, a whole slew of engineering specialists so that they could help us really understand the consequences of those climate hazards. So facilitated discussions and workshops saying this is how the climate is changing. What does that mean? What does that mean for these different elements in this asset? And then how do we how do we adapt? How do we work together as a team of you know various disciplines to come up with a plan um, that prioritizes those highest risk are we all speaking the same language do we all agree on what the highest risks are and how do we um, make our recommendations for prioritizing and building out resilience for this asset understood um, we'll stay with you for this one. And then Cal, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on it as well. Um, but, but Joelle, you know, how, if you're an environmental consultant and you're listening right now, you know, what are some of the things that they can do to assist their clients? How does that conversation start? If you're a consultant and you, you have a client and you think that this could be a service they would benefit from, can you walk us through that? How does that conversation go? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think it depends on the client. It depends on their risk tolerance. Um, some, some clients that we have seen are just, they're not there yet. You know, they, they don't want to invest money in something that they don't have to, right? So it's not a regulatory requirement in many, many cases. And so they'll say, you know what, let's defer that. We have enough. Our, our dollars are stretched as it is, um, we, we don't think that's relevant. Um, and then there, there are others who who are more agreeable and open to having that that conversation. And, you know, maybe it's not pushing them for a full resilience plan, but just helping them understand their risk, right? Most people want to understand what their risk is so that they can make an informed decision. And I think that that's the best conversation you can have. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, Cal, you and I work closely with a lot of environmental consulting firms in the United States. And, you know, you and I have had quite a few conversations about um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of, oh, you know, what do I need to do when this comes down the pike? I mean, with the environmental consultants you've worked with, you know, how is that going? You know, what are the questions they ask of you? What do you see them delivering to their clients? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, if even starting kind of higher level than that, I mean, we've seen the same progression with our customers in the U.S. where it starts with, okay, that's that's interesting. Then they look at the data, and particularly in real estate, it's all about risk mitigation, protecting your downside. I mean, the, the value add, the upside is kind of obvious, but the day-to-day -day is all about understanding risk. So the reports fit pretty neatly within that. So we've seen pretty wide adoption from the end user, right? The investor, the lender. Um, and the progression's really been, okay, now they're getting the information, they're identifying risk, and they really need help understanding. I think that's where the environmental consultants have come in. They get the information from us, then they go back to the same folks doing their other due diligence services and say, hey, can you help me understand this? And what should I do about this? because uh, we still want to buy the building so it's got a good return or we still want to make this loan uh, it still fits within our parameters and i think that's kind of how they fit into that role so it's been very demand driven um and the actual work product could be anywhere from they start providing just the report alongside the esa the phase one uh, for just due diligence of new assets to doing complete kind of desktop review of the portfolio analysis to for really high risk sites, boots on the ground and a full like human review on site, uh, more similar to an environmental site assessment. So it's really the whole spectrum, but we do see clients evolve over time and want more information and insights because they don't have climatologists on staff. They don't have professionals. It'd be like them just getting ARIS data directly. They, they need help. Right, makes sense. So a few of the clients that I work with, when we first started to talk about this type of product and them uh, performing this type of assessment in the due diligence phase, in the beginning, it really fell on the PCA side, the property condition assessment side. But in the US, 
not every single property receives both uh, assessments or, or what we'd call like a combo. So it's actually more common to do an environmental site assessment. Do you, and Joel, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Do you guys see this? Whereas, you know, six months ago, it was only property condition assessments. Do you see this being something that could go along with an environmental phase, a phase one site assessment, ESA? Are you directing that to me first, Jeff? <laughs> sure, sure, sorry. Sure. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you know, when I listened to Cal's presentation, um, I think it was a month ago, six weeks ago, he did one, a very similar one for his US audience. And um, doing doing the climate check as part of that phase one ESA or appending it to, um, it really resonated with me. It, it um, yeah, I think I think it's a really important part of the due diligence conversation, and whether clients ask for it or not, uh, I think that it's really important information to have, and it, it doesn't need to have a huge um, amount of time invested into, you know, telling them what it means, but just, hey, we've included this for your information, we'd love to tell you what it means, you know what, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it, it resonates, and I think that it's a very logical place to uh, to do that in the process. Yeah, we're seeing folks kind of doing it in both. I mean, the, alongside environmental site assessment, I mean, you have an underground storage tank or an above ground storage tank that can flood. I mean, this is a material impact to that environmental site assessment. So I think there there is overlap there. And then the PCA, right? It's like, what what is this uh, uh, improvement? So what, what is this building and how is it affected by, by climate? So we are seeing some folks do kind of climate informed PSA, uh, PCAs. Uh, as well. So I think there's overlap both or sometimes just appended as like a triple, uh, a combo or a triplet, or you have to come up with some new term for that, but all three <laughs> as a service together. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Um, we do have, uh, we've got a few questions uh, that have come in from the audience. So uh, I'm going to start uh, addressing those now. So we do have a question. Um, bear with me here. It's um, I'm going to do my best to, to read it and uh, enunciate everything clearly. Um, but it, the question is, were properties in a watershed or bioregion that's expected to undergo a substantial regulatory planning regime change? For example, in Ontario, removal of the Greenbelt development restrictions, ministerial decisions that override municipal and conservative authority development restrictions in floodplains, slopes, wetlands and other green spaces that provide natural infrastructure services. Do the climate check assessments provide info on both current and future risks? The example of flooding, if a previously protected upstream naturalized buffer zone was paved over wetlands or drained and developed. Yeah, this is a really good question. It's like most of the adaptation we're talking about so far has been property level, right? Like, can we do a little bioswell here? Can we divert water or can we harden the property from fire? But most of the successful protection that we can have to mitigate these risks happen on a community level, municipal level, provincial level. So this information is really good. And this is where the consultants come in big time uh, because once you get the risk, the current risk and projected risk, assuming there are no protections, community level protections put in place, uh, we're seeing a lot of clients going to the due diligence consultants and saying, okay, what's happening here? Like, are, are bonds being put in place in municipal level to put in fire breaks? Uh, are there uh, flood mitigation measures going in? Are there seawalls getting built? And this is complex information that needs to be researched and communicated to the to the client um, and to answer your question specifically our models don't build in all of the possible future mitigation scenarios but we're really the first step in understanding what is the risk today considering we don't do anything because uh, i think a lot of that data is more qualitative in fashion and once it gets passed if it gets built how it gets built um, and so I think that is the important role of the, that human consultant element, which, uh, which, which we rely on kind of all of you folks uh, for. Anything to add to that, Joelle? Uh, no, I, th I think I'll just add that, um, it, as Cal said, the, the human element, looking at those policies, looking at how 
the surrounding environment is changing or could change, whether um, those adaptive capacities are being added, or I think in this case, possibly removed, um, that that would be important context for the environmental professional to come in and kind of weigh in, in when they're examining the likelihood of those climate factors and when presenting the consequences of those interactions. Great. So the next question is, is there a sense of what climate risk is most important or common for properties within Canada? So this will be interesting to hear the, the data side and then the consultant side, but um, maybe Cal want to take this one first. I hate giving an answer like this, but it depends. <laughs> uh, and it depends on a lot. Um, it, it depends on region kind of folks experience firsthand experience with events i think that because this is the reality the the end client the user of the data the investor whatever is top of mind for them they lost properties in wildfire or they had assets flood in british columbia then that's going to be top of mind for them and that's probably what they're going to be most concerned about that's kind of the practical um uh, uh practical example of how it works but i think the hazards really depend on region. We see flooding kind of across the map, uh, but different regions have different uh, hazards. And so uh, I'd say, and then the, another part of it depends depends on the use case. And I think Joel talked about this pretty eloquently, like is it an Ikea or is this senior living? Uh, we do a lot of work kind of in the healthcare space and they're, the things they look at are much, much different than a tilt up industrial cross docking station which is different than a multifamily, uh, and we, which is different than retail. You know, retail might, they care about flood, uh, loss of business, maybe vehicular access is blocked. Um, I'd say across the board in real estate, folks are more concerned about flooding and fire, kind of these insurable events that cause significant loss and I'd throw wind in there too. Uh, but it really depends on the asset class and the use case and then client. Yeah, I agree, Cal. It really, really depends. Um, yeah, on, on the the risk ex acceptance and tolerance level. Um, I do have one kind of interesting uh, anecdote, I guess. Uh, when we were doing some climate risk assessments uh, within the national capital region, extreme heat is going to be a thing. Um, you know. 30, 60 years from now, and we were looking at uh, different different assets that were in very close proximity to each other, um, and a handful of them were vulnerable to extreme heat situations moving forward. Their systems were undersized. They had lots of windows just based on their design. And there was one, one property that, you know, their, their HVAC system was designed, and it was able to handle the worst case scenario 60 years out. So that specific asset was not vulnerable to extreme heat, whereas all of the others were. So it really does depend um, on the property, the asset, the element, and all of these other different conditions. So unfortunately, there's no simple answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and we are looking at kind of change in risk profile too. And a lot of the built environment, the infrastructure is built around a static climate assumptions. So I'm here in San Francisco and no one installed AC units ever. Uh, and now new construction I and mean, with, with the building code, you have to, but you're seeing retrofits of all sorts of units. Uh, and we're seeing that all across the West Coast here. So I think taking into account kind of existing local infrastructure, and that could be the buildings or kind of public infrastructure too. Um, so that's a little, a little more context there. Yeah, no, I, re I remember my uh, when I lived in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, definitely no air conditioning, and um, I think we had a gas fireplace in the center of the apartment. There was really not much heat either. Um, <laughs> interesting. Uh, let's see. We do have a question. Which model? Uh, this is to Cal. Which model do you use for wildfire risk in the U.S. and Canada, and is that model the same? Yeah, so we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll point you toward our deep methodologies, and and if you have any more questions, we connect you with the data scientists. But I mean, at its highest level, we look at a lot of factors when we're looking at wildfire. It's not just communicating one model. So we'll layer in different different uh, assumptions and and publicly available sources. So 
wherever the best data lives, we'll pull it in. So if there is, you know, sometimes there's good data in the U.S. that has coverage in Canada, and we'll lay, layer that in. Uh, but I don't have a specific answer for you on uh, which fire weather index. Uh, but I'd say the baseline of all of the the uh, ensemble of climate models is CMIP five downscale data. Uh, but uh, again, we'll point you to our, our our methodologies. We're very transparent about what data sets we're using, how we're using it, because I think this is also a point that it should make is coming increasingly important for under all these kind of regulatory requirements, but even just the end users, they want to know what the data is. They don't accept a black box. Or they want to know where it's coming from because there's a lot of projected assumptions in there. So we need to understand where, where it's coming from and how it's validated. So uh, we're very open about that. Excellent. All right. Well, um, I would like to thank you both so much for uh, all of your thoughts today uh, and, and, and for your, your speaking and sharing your knowledge. Um, any any kind of parting words of wisdom or any um, tips for the future for our uh, audience today? Uh, can I can I jump in, Cal? Yeah, uh, in in your U.S. Uh, presentation, you you made a reference to the climate risk sphere being like the wild west uh but not but not for long and i would just like to echo that sentiment is that you know things might seem a little chaotic and sporadic in approach and what clients want and what they're asking for but i i think that that's going to really streamline here in canada soon um especially as the regulatory environment changes yeah for sure i mean it is it's crazy and chaotic but we've already seen kind of folks all kind of starting to row in the same direction, more consistency. And I think the regulatory environment is something to watch, uh, watch that B-15 um, for sure. Um, don't get too depressed by this information. Uh, and I'd say also, it's evolved, the space is evolving very quickly. Uh, at yeah. high, high, it's accelerating really quickly. So uh, keep your eye on it, talk to your clients, uh, see, see what they're looking for. Um, and uh, I think I think we're going to see a lot of uh, interest within the Canadian market. Excellent, thank you. So we actually did have another question come in, so I'm going to uh, ask that now. Uh, do you expect the reinsurance industry to be a major client and or advocate for proactive regulatory changes? Yeah, I mean, I think this person knows what they're talking about for sure. <laughs> reinsurance is within the kind of insurance world. Reinsurance is where a lot of this analysis lives, and they are looking at climate risk. And it's kind of an important factor uh, that that they need to understand uh, from a business perspective. Um, are they going to be an advocate, proactive regulatory changes? I think, I think for sure. I mean, this is so complex. I mean, we need. Uh, federal level policy down to municipal level down to individual asset owners thinking about this uh, and uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of um, lobbying within the kind of regulatory space uh, amongst all the stakeholders right so if we think about stakeholders investors the equity part of the capital stack uh, the debt part lenders and then the insurers and then also the tenants when we're seeing a lot of tenants care especially like triple net long-term lease tenants uh, care. So really, if you think about a piece of real estate, all the stakeholders. Excellent. Well, that's uh, that's all the time we have for today's presentation. Um, please note that this webinar has been recorded, it will be posted on the ARIS website in the next few days. Before we close, I'd like to share that ARIS is willing is beginning to offer the climate risk assessment reports for Canada powered by Climate Check as of tomorrow. For more information, please visit erisinfo.com slash CA dash climate risk or contact our Canadian sales team, Braden Ford and Mike Seifert. For more content about climate risk, commercial real estate or environmental and property assessment, please visit the Eris Info Hub, which contains curated articles, podcasts and webinars on the topic. We look forward to hosting you at our next Eris webinar, May 17th, when we will have a virtual demonstration of our new report authoring platform called Scriva. The link is in the chat, but also on our website's homepage, erisinfo.com. For a full list of upcoming webinars and recordings from past webinars, visit our website, click on Info Hub tab, and select the webinar. On behalf of Eris and our audience, I'd like to big, give a big thank you to Cal and Joelle for sharing their immense expertise and insight with us today. And to our audience, we want to thank you for your abundant attention during this past hour and all of your excellent questions. Enjoy the rest of your day.
Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.